Former punk rocker who had deep self-doubts about his ability as a footballer, being selected for England was beyond his wildest dreams. Mr. Clough, when I'd got into the squad, he called me in and sat me down and I thought he was going to give me a little pay rise or something of that nature, you know. And he sat me down and he said, uh, so you're in the England squad? I said, that's right, Governor. Yeah. He said, uh, do you think you're good enough? I said, to be honest with you, I don't know. He went, no, no. He said, I don't, you know. Now get out. England's new cap, 25-year-old Stuart Pearce from Nottingham Forest. Pearce's international debut stretched plausibility even further. England's opponents were the greatest team in the world, Brazil. For the purists, it was genius against hard graft. One thing that sticks out in my mind from that game was a tackle that Stuart went into with um, the Brazilian right back called Josimar. And Stuart went in for this 50-50. Josimar came in about half a second later, studs showing right down Stuart's shin. I was about five yards away from the incident and I was, I was really fearful for him because I thought he must have broken his leg. And Stuart just got up and walked away. And Josimar actually was left on the floor holding his ankle. He actually kicked Stuart but he twisted his ankle because he kicked him with such force. That's probably the worst tackle I've seen on a player who was just, didn't even flinch. He shook people up, you know, and people saw that. People saw him, you know, with three lines on his chest. And he was proud of the shirt, and he, and he just gave everything that he had. Pierce's career blossomed at club level. Honest toil and a reputation for effort, commitment and fearlessness endeared him to Forest fans as the club won the League Cup twice. Pierce and Nottingham Forest have done it again. As an England player, his willingness to graft helped build a special relationship with hardcore supporters hungry for English patriotism when the very idea seemed old-fashioned. He has the lines, three lines there, and he wears it. I'm sure he'd have tattooed three lines as well. England is my art, and England is my love. You go away with England, there's no one that's not one of the lads. Everyone's all together. Manchester, Newcastle, England supporters are a massive family. It's like, you're English, you're me, mate. I've only known you two minutes. What are you having to drink, mate? If somebody whack somebody, then they don't whack someone who you don't know. If whack somebody who's wearing an England shirt and he's one of us. So that's where sometimes it does get a little bit stupid or eated. But the England that Psycho had grown up in seemed to be on a collision course with football. Violence on the terraces was on the increase. Riots and crowd disorder led to clubs being banned from European competition. England's reputation was tarnished, and its status as a leading international team was under threat. The pressure was on to get tough with hooligans. Any time you get trouble with English fans overseas, then we feel it's a blot on the fair name of our country. Any player that works hard at their profession, and the World Cup comes around once every four years, and the European Championships once every four years, if you miss one, you might never ever play in another one. We had the scenario that, that we might be kicked out of Europe at international level. And it got very close to that, I have to tell you. It was that far away, I have to tell you. I mean, that far away. England narrowly escaped from the ignominy of being excluded from the World Cup in Italy. When the team arrived, a lack of European experience at club level had put the international squad at a serious disadvantage. I've had sort of a season and a half of qualifiers and a couple of friendlies before we went to the big tournament. But when you stepped up again onto that next stage, the world's media was there, it was much more intense. <laughs> The match against Belgium brought two very different characters into the frame. Psycho, the tough but reliable fan on the pitch, and Paul Gascoigne, the unpredictable and erratic talisman. Gascoigne's incisive last-minute pass to Platt resulted in the winning goal. Uh, and I remember sort of getting up and shouting, oh, Paul, he kind of looked and I said, you know, get it into the box. And he looked up and sort of, like, okay, like, and... Platt, he had read it and just kept on side and hooked it and volleyed this remarkable goal, you know, like the goal of the century, if you like. The quarter-finals. England were favourites, but far from popular. 
the African champions Cameroon had captured the Italian public's romantic imagination. We had the shout from, I think, Howard Wilkinson who said, oh, you've got to buy into the next round, you've got Cameroon, which was probably the hardest buy that I've ever played in my life, you know? Here with this intricate underground tunnel, they had to walk under the pitch and walk around and came out behind the goal. We'd got there possibly, you know, four or five minutes before the Cameroon team. We were a little bit irked that they'd kept us waiting. So there's the old English banter of, come on, let's go, get stuck in, all that kind of stuff. You could just hear this chanting. The captains chirped up with a little song. All the rest of the squad have, have chirped in with a chorus. And that's gone on right the way round under the pitch. And we thought, hang on, what's going on here? You know what I mean? But if it got them up for the, for the game, brilliant. We've scored it reasonably early on. Platt has scored. I've crossed one and Platt has headed one in. So we've gone one nil up. We thought, well, we're home and dry here. We're right. We have got a bye. 13-year-old Jamie Connolly, photographed with his hero Pierce, was one of thousands of England fans in Italy. He couldn't get a ticket and watched the game with his mum in a crowded bar. So he just thought, right, everything's going to be, you know, hunky-dory, sit here, watch us win. England led by a goal at half-time, but the unpredictable Gascoigne conceded a clumsy penalty, allowing Cameroon to equalise. The Italian crowd were fervently behind the underdogs. The reputation of their violent fans had turned England into a target of vilification. And all of a sudden, the Italians seemed to infiltrate the bar, uh, purely just to like, antagonise the English. Two for a kick Cameroon are in the lead! And then it got a bit uppity when the Cameroon scored. The Italian fans were celebrating. But then England's luck turned. A tense moment for the fans as Lineker took the penalty. Two all and the game went to extra time. Gary Lineker, England's top scorer, scrambled towards the Cameroon goal and was brought down. England were gifted another penalty and an unlikely 3-2 win. And we've managed to nick it at the end and we come off the pitch and to be fair, the, the feeling in the camp was we've got away with Blue Murder a little bit here. But in the bars and out on the streets, an ugly mood had gripped the tournament. The English fans obviously started celebrating and then that's when the Italians came steaming in. And then the bar ended up getting tear gassed and all the English arrested. And the Italian police just protected their own, really. And when we got the papers through the next day, it was all like English scum and showed the scenes actually outside the bar where we'd been in half an hour earlier, you know, just enjoying the match. The victory over Cameroon put England into the semi-final of the World Cup, where they drew an old and ominous enemy, Germany. It was an encounter that would change football in England and was to set the stage for the patriotic Stuart Pearce. Italia 90, the semi-finals. England against arch-rivals Germany, with Pearce and Gascoigne as central characters. This time, England had the talent to win, and the patriotic stakes were sky high. The German game was one of those where, hang on a minute, we've got further than the, the, the team did previous in 1986, we've got further than any team have done on foreign soil, we've got further than any team had done since 1966, so in that respect, that lifted a lot of pressure off the team. How did I feel at that point? Complete and utter dejection. My whole life just went out of my body, to be honest. That was the saddest day, one of the saddest days of my life. So I don't cry very often, I'm quite a strong bloke, but I did that. And terrible, terrible, terrible. I'll never forget it, it was sad. I remember us all just sat there in a line it must have been for a 35, 40 minutes after the game had finished and none of us, none of us had dry eyes. Probably it comes out then how passionate you are about England and football. Emotionally drained and surrounded by the victorious Germans, Stuart Pearce was to suffer a further humiliation. He was selected for a random drug test and was holed up in a room waiting to be tested with two members of the German team. Having just missed a penalty about 
10 minutes previous, the last thing I wanted to do was, was go and sit in a room with two Germans. It was that hot, you, we were losing probably about seven, eight pounds per matches in sweat. I couldn't have a pee for love nor money. Schiltz come in, done one and went again, straight away. So that just left me with two Germans sat there. If someone come in, you wouldn't know who'd won and who'd lost out of the two nations. They were very humble. I don't know whether two English players would have been that humble. And it taught me a little bit of a lesson, actually, how humble they were on that day. Dehydrated and depressed, Psycho had to drink eight litres of water in order to give a sample. Later that night, reflecting on the match, a final irony awaited him. So as luck happens, we had a dustbin that was one of those tin bins, just rolled that over by the side of the bed. Every time I wanted to go away, I would just lean over at the side of the bed, have a wee, and then roll back into the bed again. Got time to sort of think about it overnight. I think Shelley and I sat up talking actually to about half three in the morning, was wondering how he was feeling and how he was coping with it. When I woke up in the morning, it must have been that much full up. It done a job, and I was just pleased that they had uh, been without a hole in, to be honest. <laughs> Italia 90 changed the image of football. Mass audiences had been gripped by the emotional roller coaster, and Stuart Pearce, the tragic hero, was now one of football's biggest and most unlikely superstars. Once we got back to Luton, it's incredible. Well, me and Chrissy Waddle thought we were going to get lynched by the general public, really, to be honest, you know. I don't think we could have got a better response or a better turnout had we won the World Cup. I think it took us maybe about four hours to travel five miles, which was probably my biggest nightmare. I just wanted to get in my car, meet Liz and go. Major campaign, the finals of Euro 92. After a draw against Denmark, the second match was against France, and an off-the-ball incident brought Pierce and his psycho reputation back into the limelight. I think the only sort of highlights of the games were probably myself getting head butted and, and then hitting the underside of the bar with a free kick shortly afterwards. But a corner then to the French. I'd clashed with the right winger, Anglemar. The ball got tossed in for a corner and I think I've caught him in the box. Was in. And Bowley's reacted to it. It's a bit of a clash off the ball there, involving Anglemar and Pierce. He sort of done an arcing run which took him past my face and just headbutted me on the way past and, and kept running. Oh my goodness, somebody came in and there. I'm not sure it wasn't Bowley actually. It was something that the referee didn't see, all the linesmen didn't see basically, but um, give me the ump a little bit at the time as you can well imagine. Look at Stuart Pearce under his right eye. Throughout the game even the commentators are saying, you know, it's only a matter of time before Bowley gets one. The English uh, players were very upset with that one. I shouldn't think Pearce was very happy either. But instead of chasing Baz and Bowley up the line, landing a punch on them, he had the reaction I would expect from him. I think he realised the, the repercussions that it'd have if he did retaliate, then he was going to get sent off. And I think that's maybe a thing that people don't consider that much about Stuart Pearce, they all think of this cycle image. It doesn't really hold up, a cycle's uncontrolled, he's totally controlled. He's got a lot of aggression but it's all, you get a feeling it's all you know, under control. Pierce's self-control and his ability to unsettle opponents with the intimidating mind games of modern football strengthened the psycho legend. For England fans, he was a player who would give blood for his country. We'd had a free kick. As I've gone back to line up to take it, the referee's run over and said, you're going to have to go out and sort your face out. I thought he meant looks-wise, but it appeared that the, the slight nick on my face that he was talking about. So my last comment was don't take this until I get back so I managed to just put a little bit of Vaseline in the blood and just remember Gary Lineker coming up to me and going just fucking smash it Pierce for England oh a decent crossbar what a better way to show what you're made of I was not in close quarters with Bowley who was playing at the other end of the pitch I was in close quarters with Anglemar who's an out and out sort of winger so I still had a job to do with him Anglemar in goes Pierce, knocks it in quickly. And I thought it would further help my performance if I put the blood coming down my face straight on his doorstep and said, you've done that, I'm going to sort you out for doing it.
which he said, no, no, not me, not me, someone else, someone else. And it just a little bit of psychology, basically. It helps my game. If I can sow a seed in his mind that he's thinking, shit, he's mad with me, he thinks I've headbutted him. You need all the help you can get on a football pitch, and these are little, you know, one-to-one -one sort of uh, little mind games, maybe, you know. Despite the bloody mind games, England only drew with France, and in the next match found themselves neck and neck with Sweden and desperate to stay in the tournament. Taylor made the momentous and controversial decision to substitute Gary Lineker. In the furore, the captain's armband was passed to Stuart Pearce. Obviously I jumped at it, you know, it's a massive honour to be asked to captain your country. Probably the biggest honour that's been bestowed on me in my professional career. Beaten by Sweden, Taylor's England came home to ritual humiliation. In 1994, England failed to qualify for the World Cup and Graham Taylor was sacked. Wholesale changes were required and the future of several players, including Pearce, hung in the balance. One man stood out as the saviour of England, the gregarious Terry Venables. When I took over, my first phone call to Stuart Pearce was... Um, to tell him, you know, I was going to look at Graham Lasso at left back in that position and uh, I wanted to know what he felt. The phone call was to, for me to butt in at that time and say, OK, fine, you know, I was going to call it a day anyway. He did well, Graham Lasso, straight off. But Stuart stayed in there and, and this is what you always say to players, you never know. Don't think you've been written off. The hardest night came in 1995 in Dublin. Pierce was now a second choice player watching his beloved England from the stands. He had responded to the call knowing he wouldn't play. For Pierce, it was a night of personal disappointment. For England, a night of unexpected and unmitigated violence. To try and I had to sit next to Gaza for, uh, for 10 hours. Paul, I think he'd just won the double with Glasgow Rangers that weekend. He'd had a couple of beers because he's a bad flyer at the best of times. The steward had enough of him and, and Gazza's ended up patting him around the side to get his attention. And something that you don't often see on an aeroplane, a steward punching a passenger. <laughs> and it was, uh, he's just gave Gazza a little rabbit punch on the side of the head and walked off all in one motion like. And then he got hold of the pilot and, and the pilot had to say, you know, look, you've got to calm down, son. They were going to do a stopover in Moscow to fray him off. And uh, Gazza's bottom lip started going again and turned round to us and said, he's going to throw me off in Russia, he's going to throw me off in Russia. It's probably one of the funniest things I've ever seen, to be fair. But Gascoigne's problems were just beginning. England won in China, but victory was unconvincing and the press were hovering for a story. Gaza duly obliged. Terry had said, right, you, you have done the job, lads, you can have a beer tonight. Um, it was Gaza's birthday. I'd been advised not to go out that evening. <laughs> and I thank the person who advised me. I'm not going to say who he is. I said, I'm not going out tonight. And they said, why not? I said, it just ain't worth it. I said, the boys would go out, they'd be stood all around. Everyone knows who you are. In my experience, he said, <laughs> uh, when some of the lads would go for a drink, you'd think they'd never had a drink before in their life. <laughs> Tonight in Hong Kong, nightclubbers were finding out what some of England's footballers do on a night off. I went along with them as part of the, uh, as a member of the staff, just to make sure that everything was okay. They decided to go on this chair, and then they'd had a cocktail. They started ripping each other's shirts. You tried to stop them from doing what young lads are young lads. People had cameras in there and they're taking photos of them. The press salivated over another football scandal and as Euro 96 neared, England's reputation had taken another battering. This absolutely just fell in their lap, to be honest. We had pictures of the boys in dentist chairs and got those what else, which I looked at it and it tickled me, to be 